여기 비행기에 참여한다고. 어. 왜 그렇지? 일단 우리 활주로 바로 할게요. 어. 완전 좋은 자리다. 완전 좋은 자리네. 어, 바다에 보이네. 어머, 좋다. 이렇게 좋은 데를 놔두고 안 오다니. 야. 어, 너무 좋다. 설기야. 이거 안 봤으면 너무 억울할 뻔 했다. 와. 와, 이게 어디냐. 대한민국 만세. 태국이 갖고 올걸 잘못했다. 와. 와. 저 아저씨가 우리가 비행기 착륙하는 걸 모른다 맞죠? 와. 맞죠? 그냥 공원 산책하러 와. 와. 너무 좋다. 와. 이게 알래스카 바다란 말이다. one point that he'll be able to escape if he tries this. He takes a spike, he drives it into the ice. He ties a rope onto that spike, takes the other end of the rope, ties it onto his lead dog, Togo. If he gets close enough to the bank, this is what he intends to do. He picks the dog up on the bank and holds to the mess. He gets about 12 feet away from the bank, he throws Togo up on the bench, up on the, on the bank, and commands, he, Togo, he, the command to pull. And Togo just digs in and pulls. He's able to get him to a point where he can get the sled and the serum off the ice floor back on the land they continue on the journey. Now, we've always thought Kogo deserves a little bit of credit for that effort. He was 12 years of age at the time, pretty old for a sled dog, so they retired him after his service there in that moment. But in retirement, he was able to father 260 puppies. Most every uh, team that the daughter did on that run has a, a descendant of Kogo in their bloodline because the dogs are amazing. diphtheria outbreak and 59 children lay sick and dying in the hospital in Nome. So the idea was of course that they would hopscotch by using dog teams the serum across Alaska, each team handing off to the next team to get the serum into Nome, Alaska. Now Balto was the lead dog that came into Nome finally with the serum. So you got a picture on the Wall Street Journal, the only dogs who have ever done so. Belonged to a marshal the name of, of uh, Leonard Seppler. Leonard Seppler was a famous musher here in Alaska. He actually ran the mail from uh, from Nome, Alaska to Shaktulik, Alaska, a round trip distance of about 300 miles. Now, Leonard had loaned Balto and, the, and another team to another musher so they could successfully hopscotch the serum across Alaska to get it there. He was on his way to meet another musher, musher by the name of Gunnar Claussen. Gunnar Claussen held the serum and uh, Leonard was supposed to pick up the serum from Gunner. As they were going past each other in the middle of a snowstorm, they passed each other. They couldn't see each other. Kept going. Uh, Togo only went up a short distance and he stopped in the middle of the trail. It's pretty unusual for a lead dog. They're usually going to be the most obedient. They're going to stick around and do the hard work. They're the engine that makes the engine that makes things makes things happen. He stops. Kind of confused uh, self up for a minute, but he figures out, ah, I missed Leonard. Gets the serum, now he's on his way. Now each of you are born with a map of Alaska, you just didn't know it. This is the map of Alaska. Why don't you think with me in your mind's eye about it? Unless you're left hand, of course, then this is, of course, the map of Alaska. So this is Southeast Alaska. This is the Aleutian chain that goes out towards Japan. Right now you're in South Central Alaska, right there. Interior, we'll call that Fairbanks, Alaska. And then the nose of Alaska is where Nome is, is out there. Around here is called the Norton Sound. The Norton Sound is a body of water that freezes over during the winter months, but thaws in the springtime. Except like gets to this point of the journey, he's got a choice to make. I can go around the Norton Sound, or I can, uh, uh, which will take three or four additional days, or I can go uh, across the ice. It's a bit of a risky move, because the ice could go out at any time. Well, he chooses to go across the ice. He gets about three quarters of the way across the ice, and the ice breaks up now, and begins moving out into the ocean. So now he's on the ice floe with the serum and his dog team. 
not really sure what he's going to do. But he figures out that the lands is going to... Companies that tried to build the Alaska Railroad went bankrupt. So finally in 1914, the federal government stepped up and said they would not only fund, but they would uh, actually build the Alaska Railroad. They came to Alaska, did it. Sent 2,000 men. Those men lived in 1,000 insulated army tents in this area down here and built the Alaska Railroad. This is where the original town site of Anchorage was, is down here next to the railroad. The little engine to your left is little Alaska engine number one. It was used in the building of the Alaska Railroad, but before coming here, it was actually used in the building of the Panama Canal. Now notice the bumper on the front of that train, it's called the Moose Cruiser. That little uh, engine would go ahead of the coal train and bump into the moose that were on the tracks, off the tracks, so that the train wouldn't get derailed. It's a very valuable purpose. Finished that line in 1916. Uh, decided in uh, 1923 to build a line into the interior of Alaska, which they did. Now at the time, Warren G. Harding is president of the United States. And he decides that since he's president, he should be able to come to uh, Anchorage and he should be able to drive in the last spike to join these two lines together. So he writes to people and says, yeah, what's the weather like? Well, sir, it can be quite uh, chilly. We suggest that you wear your woolen underwear, hats, coats, gloves, and mittens. Dress warm when you come to Alaska. And it can be chilly in Anchorage, Alaska. But he's going to the interior Alaska, to Fairbanks, Alaska. And on the day he's to drive in the spike, it's 95 degrees in Fairbanks, Alaska. Well, he swings up and it's not quite six times, but no, 12 times before he finally hits the spike. And they'll report in their, in their newspapers that he was suffering from heat frustration. That's why he had a hard time hitting the spike. But those of us here in Alaska will tell you that no, actually he was suffering from intoxication. He had too many beers on the train ride up to Alaska trying to cool off in that hot weather. Because you can go to the old YouTube videos of that moment. And you watch him swing and he stumbles around. He swings and he stumbles around. And finally the guy, the voiceover comes on and says, President Harding taking practice swing before standing in the fire. On the right side of the trolley is the Cook Inlet, named after the famed British explorer, Captain James Cook. James Cook came to uh, Alaska in, in beginning in the year of uh, 1776. That would be amazing if he did that then. So he came up here. He was actually sent by King George III to go on three exploratory expeditions. Uh, this is kind of a picture of Cook's. Uh, this is his good side as we fly by. You can come out a little later. There's some nice monuments, some good good visual pictures off the edge there. So King George was interested in finding a great northwest passage, a body of water that went through North America to speed up trade between the Atlantic to the Pacific side. Uh, so Cook takes off, he gets around the west coast of North America, runs into a group of Indians called the Chumash Indians. The Chumash Indians tell him, yes, if you keep sailing north, you're going to find that great body of water. But what he finds is the Columbia River, and he knows that it's just simply not big enough. So he continues to sail up. He gets into these waters here. Now he thinks he's in a river. He's very excited about that. Well, how does he know that? Well, they used to take a bucket of water, throw it, throw it over the side of the ship, uh, take a bucket, throw it over the side of the ship, fill it with water, bring it back up and taste the water. If the water tasted salty, then they must be in an ocean still. But if it tasted fresh, then they must be in fresh water. And he thought he was. So Cook sails up, he gets uh, up to the head of the waters and realizes he can sail no farther at that point the river comes to an end and so he turns around comes back and anchoring off near where his statue is located today writes in his journal i fear once again that i must turn again my ship into the open ocean in search of the great northwest passage that i see so the body of water that we saw in front of us is called the cook inlet but where he came in is called the turnigan arm because cook had to turn again his ship into the open ocean now in 1917, the uh, city of Anchorage ended right there at the end of North Ave uh, 19th Avenue. And that's of course where that park strip is on either side. There was actually uh, trees that were there. They cleared them off to create a fire break between uh, uh, the forest and downtown Anchorage. They were afraid of a forest fire burning the town of Anchorage down. Now in Alaska we have 360 million acres, 240 million of which are forested in some degree. Uh, in the end of, this, of the season that we're in right now, the leaves come off the tree and they fall to the forest floor. There they're compacted over the course of five to seven years by ice and snow. Uh, and then they, they dry out and become a product called duff. Duff is a highly flammable material that uh, does not allow the, the sunlight to hit the forest floor. Lightning strikes come and hits the duff and ignites it, burns it up, and then we're able to have uh, 
uh, light come to the forest floor once again. Some of the first things that grow back in a burned out forest in Alaska are both the willow tree and fireweed. <coughs> Willow tree are important to the life cycle of the moose. A uh, life cycle will eat 25 pounds of willow leaves a day in the summertime and 25 pounds of willow leaves a day, uh, willow bark, I'm sorry, in the wintertime. Their body actually goes through a change where they're able to gnaw off the bark of the tree and turn it into nutrition. So, kind of an unusual experience. Now, in 1964, there were two high schools in Anchorage, Alaska West Anchorage High School on the west side of town, and East Anchorage High School on the east side of town. Now, I'm a proud graduate of West Anchorage High School class of 1971 and the, the building you see to your left of course is West Anchorage High School and the mural you see was a donation that we made to the school. There was to be an inscription on it. The inscription was to read from the graduating class of 1971. We wish you best of luck on your journey. The principal said that they would accept the mural but they would not allow the inscription to be put on the building. A little disappointed in that. We talked to the local artist, a guy named Werner Stitzer. He said, is there any way you can help represent the class of 1971 in the mirror? I said, oh, absolutely, I can do that. So look at the yellow talons there. Look above the yellow talons and the black paint there. Do you see anything in the negative in that paint? You see it? Say it. 71. Good job. So on the right side, there's one giant 71. And on the right side, there's three smaller ones. Now, don't worry. Look up here. We're full service trolley. We'll give you, we'll, we'll give you, we'll give you a hand here. Don't worry. <laughs> Look back again. So, one big on the left, three smaller ones on the right. Now, principal bless his heart, didn't see it for four years after the fact. <laughs> the only reason he found out about it was because the secretary of the school ran us out and showed him where it was. So, we just started school about 10 days or so ago, and you'll see uh, kids out here all lined up looking and pointing. They know exactly what they're looking for. They're 71 and 50 year old. It's kind of fun. Kind of fun little unusual thing in Anchorage. Now, always good to review. 1964, 9.2 of the Richter scale, 4 minutes and 38 seconds, 15,000 acres displaced. Yet in Anchorage, Alaska, only nine people lost their life as a result of the earthquake. Nine, how is that possible? We had a population of 30 to 35,000. What's up? Well, it's because it was Good Friday. There wasn't anybody to speak of in the uh, buildings. And with that population, they've estimated that had it taken place on any other work day other than Good Friday, we would have lost probably 10% of our population. But, uh, we count ourselves very, very fortunate that it did happen on a Good Friday. We have a very short growing season up here in Alaska, and, but we're able to grow many typical things you might grow in some of your gardens, lettuce and broccoli, kale, cauliflower, zucchini, beets, radishes, things like that. <clears throat> we also have uh, a lot of wild fruits, uh, raspberries, blueberries, salmon berries, uh, uh, melon berries, iron low bush cranberries. We're also able to grow certain varieties of hardened crab apples. So as we turn to the left here on the right hand side, you'll see a crab apple forest we're trying to develop here. Now the reason they're wrapped in wire is because moose <clears throat> not only love crab apples, they love crab apple trees. And if you don't wrap those trees in wire, they will eat them all the way to the ground. Also, if you don't pick all the crab apples off of the tree, in the fall of the year when they come on, so to speak, uh, they'll ferment on the tree. And moose are also very, very fond of fermented crab apples. Now we had a moose that loved them so much, and he became famous for it. His name was Buzzwinkle the Alcoholic Moose. Now, Buzzwinkle would wander from uh, crab apple tree to crab apple tree, eating the fermented crab apples, and he would uh, enjoy himself as doing that. Now, uh, of course, he would eventually die. And so the idea was they were going to donate his flesh to the local zoo. However, zoo officials refused or rejected the idea, saying they were not going to feed alcohol-infused meat to the polar bear. That was just something they were going to do that. But his remains were given to the fishing game where he was used to trap, tag, and track wolverines throughout Alaska. Now, in Alaska, there are four major tribal groups. Five major tribal groups, four of which build their homes in underground homes and called Bara Bara. Typically, a Bara Bara is built by taking the framework of a whale, burying it in the ground, tying the framework together, then mounding dirt over the top of it, and digging a tunnel back in to gain entrance of it. Now, in 1885, Mr. and Mrs. Isaacson thought that'd be a fun idea, so they built their house into this hill here over to our right. This is a modern day Bara Bara. They raised their five kids in this underground home. The, uh, there's 14 steps to the front door. The glass goes all the way uh, up the hill. 
Of course, the dirt comes <coughs> underneath the window sill, uh, window sills of each of that. The skylights at the back of the home are the only natural daylight that goes into the home at the rear of the house. Uh, it says that it only costs about eighty dollars a month to heat it, which I think is remarkable. In the deepest, darkest part of winter, which is just amazing. But you got to mow your roof on occasion. That's the downside. And what's the cost of living in Alaska? Well, the cost of living in Alaska is about twenty-five percent greater than that of the continental U.S. Uh, even though we're such a large state, we only have about 33,000 miles of improved roads here in Alaska. Uh, by way of contrast, in Seattle, Washington, downtown Seattle, you guys have over a million miles of paved road down in downtown Seattle. So quite a, quite a contrast between the two. Now, uh, our oldest son works in rural Alaska. We, uh, rur rural Alaska, we also call it Bush Alaska. He just finished a village, uh, working in a village uh, of Tuntatuliak, and he found it necessary to buy a gallon of milk. He paid uh, $13 for a gallon of milk. He had to pay $7 for a loaf of bread, and a can, a single can of soda pop was actually only $3. It costs a lot to get goods into Bush, Alaska. That's because it has to be either flown in, or it has to be taken up river only in the spring and summertime when the rivers are free of ice and snow along the way. Now growing up as a kid here in Alaska, we only got uh, fresh fruit and vegetable barges in about four or five times a year. And the last one come in about the uh, middle of November. There my mom would go down to the local grocer and for example, she'd get a head of lettuce. A head of lettuce she would bring home and then she would uh, take that head of lettuce and completely separate out all of the leaves off of the head of lettuce. Then she put it in the fridge. But she did it by putting down a wet paper towel, then a leaf of lettuce, then a wet paper towel, then a leaf of lettuce. She did that.
Sonne.
양양변님5점9구무채5점9구고등어5점9구고등어5점9구고등어5 30분밖에 안 남아서 못 들어가요. 아, 그러면 안 돼요. 박물관 집에 사람도 한 시간. 아니 그래서 마치기 30분 전에 도착해 갖고 비가 와가지고 그냥 그날은 못 갔어요. 
Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Oh, oh. 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 여러분 이렇게 멋진 곳을 좀 바다 보, 보고 제창에 음. 가는 거 보러 갔다 음. 음. 와 너무 멋지다 활주로 보이셨나요? 음. 이렇게 활주로 음. 보이셨나요? 여기는 처음 보여요 여기 처음 보지 물이 깨끗하지 않네. 저기 비행기 보이네. 내 생각에는 만약에 어. 저기서 손이.